thatgreatbusinessshow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil the best anyone can get made in Ireland sold worldwide Welcome to episode 60 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 5th of November 2021. I am Conal O'Moran. This week on Ireland's best business podcast, don't call him a footballer or a designer, he's a publisher and he's Paul Galvin. And he's joining Team GBS today for a chat like no other. Nothing about sports, strictly business, as always. We scour the highways and the ways to find sources of cheap money for your business, and we found someone with money to give away. But not before he tells us why he thinks Irish business, small and medium-sized, have a really poor financial literacy. And you know those mobile phone towers that look like trees? Well, an industrial designer came up with that idea. Designers are also currently making ugly electricity pylons look like old-fashioned telegraph poles. So what could design do for your business? As Donald Byrne of Big Red Barn says, we don't do problems, only solutions. On episode 59, we had the two lads from Bonishtorboardgame.ie, and no sooner had they left the studio than they found out that, as happens, there was a hitch in production. But all is now well. So if you were looking for one of their only 3,000 copies of their game being made, being made, then Smiths and all great toy stores should be getting their stocks in around about now. However, I'm ahead of you. I pre-ordered mine online, banishedoorboardgame.ie, and I know one little lad who's going to be thrilled that Mr. S. Claus is coming in the next couple of weeks with one under his arm. And something else that could make a rather nice Christmas gift is the free Android tablet that the guys at Big Red Cloud Accountancy software are giving away if you sign up with them. Listen back to CEO Mark O'Dwyer on episode 58 to find out all about that. And as always, we wish to thank our wonderful sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, makers of the world's best shaving oil. Their support brings you the best business stories and insights every week. Now that we're travelling again, their 25ml bottle of all-natural shaving oil is your ideal travel companion and shipping is totally free for orders over €20. Now, I had a long chat with former secondary school teacher and Kerry GAA legend Paul Galvin the other day, during which time he told me that he doesn't like to be called a designer. He sees himself as a publisher. Most of you will know that Paul has a long-standing collaboration on clothing lines with Dunn Stores, and he has just launched another smaller niche line aimed directly at GAA clubs called the Cuhan Athletic Club. If you're involved at any level in a GAA club, this part is a must-listen. It might even make your club some money. But back to this idea of being a publisher. There are lessons to be learned from the time and effort that Paul puts into giving a sense of language and place to his designs, something that all brands strive for. And I'm really interested to hear what his thinking is and what his future business plans are. Paul Galvin, ta Walterwood, good day, that great business show. Good morning, Connell. Yes, yes, Vahon Letter. Paul, the way you say it, you... You think an awful lot. When we were chatting on the phone, I could hear yeah, just the way you're, you're just not like others in the way that you want to position your business. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think that's just. A, I suppose it's a, it's a worldview as much as a kind of a business view, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a language based approach to design and and this this fashion this fashion world you know i i just see it as a i've i've based the business while it's a commercial business and it's retail and it's numbers i've i've kind of built my my business with dons on on language actually and storytelling and um that's that's been my that's been my approach from the start you know so i've i've always kind of seen it i've always seen it as a form of publishing really as much as 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 anything you know that's really interesting, the use of language just by calling it publishing. Now, how much of this is down to your Kerry roots? There's a huge storytelling thing. If you go down the West Coast, really, but Kerry, Claire, huge storytelling. Yeah, yeah, v- very much so. And nor Kerry particularly, you know, and I'd, I'd be I'd be conscious of it. I'd be very proud of it, actually, the literary history of, of nor Kerry, the great writers and poets that we, we have had and still have. So 
I think it's I think that's part of it actually. I do. I I um I mean, I was reading recently quite heavily over lockdown period about John B and listening to a lot of John B's not so much his plays and poems, but his interviews and his sayings and his ability to to, to articulate and and uh I found him a fascinating, insightful, future thinking guy, you know. So I I think the Nor Kerry heritage of storytelling is probably in me a little bit and and as much as Kerry football I'd be equally conscious and proud of the the storytelling and the storytellers that we have in our carry. So, I think it's I think it's a little bit of that maybe g- g- driving me. And um, but I think brands and desi- like you you mentioned earlier it was interesting the point you made in your intro about design and the world of design and how design can help your business. The whole world is designed, you know. But I, I think we underappreciate design largely. Um, but from from GAA to retail to the physical stores to the clothing. To content, Every, everything's really designed, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, um, yeah, it's part of that, and it's part of the fact that I was a teacher, I think, as well. Well, let me pick you up on yeah. that immediately because you were a teacher, Greg, and uh, geography, and then you turn a full full one eighty, maybe a full three sixty, maybe seven hundred and twenty degrees, and you start publishing mm. or mm. designing or whatever. There are clotheslines that you now make. Yeah, there are, there are, and I basically took that. I did eight or nine or ten years of teaching, ten nearly in the end. And I really grew tired of it, but I felt... What did, I, you, I could what did bring, you grow tired of? I, I, unfortunately, I grew tired of Irish, unfortunately, which I love. And we, it was great for me. It was the first time in a long, long time that I've used my Irish, the, the, speaking with you on the phone the other day. Yeah. It was absolutely fantastic. And it came to me quite quickly and naturally, I think. It wasn't too bad. We were able to converse. <laughs> we were able to converse <laughs> anyway. So, but that's the first time in a long time I've used my Irish and it was fantastic to use it again. But unfortunately, as a teacher, I, it, it did put me off a little bit uh, if you're a creatively minded person, repetition can f- be difficult. And there was a lot of repetition with Irish. And, and, and I just, I don't know, I just began to lose interest and enthusiasm for it. And I felt if I kept teaching for another 20 years, I'd be a really poor teacher. I would have just, because your interest levels are tied to your enthusiasm and your ability to impart whatever it is you're imparting. And my interest levels were, were diminishing and I felt I would be a very ordinary teacher very very soon. So I wanted to bring education to this world of menswear and brands. And but why, why, you know, where did that come from? Yeah, I don't know. A lot of educators around me in North Kerry as well. I grew up like my parish of Lixna in North Kerry. I was highly influenced by teachers growing up. Now, the, the teaching is one thing, but why clothing? Like you could have been making lights, you could have been mm. making cars, you could have been making yeah. whatever. yeah. That goes back to, I think, my sport and sports brands like Adidas. I was always aware of brands when I was growing up. Levi's, Farah, Wrangler, Adidas, Mitre, Diodora, Illes. So watching games, I would have always been conscious of the football, for instance. The Mitre football, I found, was a beautifully... Like, footballs are designed, do you know what I mean? You never think of footballs or football boots being designed. But I would have been conscious of the kits that Man United wore the footballs that were used in the old First Division, Premier League, um, the Stadia even. I, I would have been very conscious of the shapes and materials used in Stadia. You're a frustrated architect. I, 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 you know, something, my, I, I say to my wife, you know, sometimes, someday soon, I'm going to go into architecture and, no, it's a tough trot. I speak to architects a lot, you know, and it's six or seven years of study. Seven and, years and then yeah, you start. And then you start, yeah, absolutely. But I do I do keep in touch with architects because I'm fascinated by architecture, actually, and bioarchitecture particularly. What is bioarchitecture? Well, yeah, that's a big one, Connell. What is it exactly? It's, it's something I learned about on Netflix. I'm a huge fan of Netflix. I find it a great source of education myself. And I watched a series, I, I keep watching the series called Abstract, which is a design series. And one of the programs is based on a woman called Neri Oxman, who is an Israeli, an Israeli architect, but she has pioneered bioarchitecture in MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So it's basically new materials in, in architecture. So they will be, God, in a, she's innovating with cells and growing things in cells and in labs to create new materials that can be incorporated, implemented into material design or in industrial design, basically. And I just, you know, I just found it fascinating and, and it's something new. And I think anything new that you don't know anything about is a good place to, I find that interesting. I always get stuck into it. So, um, yeah, and Stadia of late, I'm really looking at a lot of Stadia from a design point of view. And they make, they make great shapes and angles. If you go onto Google Maps, which I do a lot, and you 2D, say, Croke Park, or you 2D, 
Wembley Stadium on Google Maps. You get beautiful shapes for that can become prints. And so back to the clothing. Mm. We've got to talk to you about clothing. Yeah. Which came first, Dunn Stores or the clothing line, or did you marry the two first of all, or who made the first call to whom? Yeah, yeah, that was that, that was it. The, I basically I wrote a book. I wrote a book on my on my sporting career and and in I, my own in my own words. words. Yeah, yeah, you I did it myself. The, you better get the ad out. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's Ro- to royalties, royalties, royalties. <laughs> and probably a tax break as well. Yeah, well, if you write it yourself, you, you can apply for exemptions and whatnot. So anyway, I was lucky to be able to do that. But I did, I wrote the book, and then I was just observing the the, the Irish retail landscape and uh, the menswear landscape. And I felt, you know, there was probably nobody making clothes that I, I understood or that meant something. I wanted to add a bit of meaning and a bit of language and a bit of storytelling to menswear. I was ob- observing the UK high street for years. I'd go into shops and I'd just look around me and it was all just meaningless stuff to me. I really couldn't relate to what I was seeing. I could wear it, but it didn't mean anything. So I would see prints of bananas and birds and flowers on shirts. and Not uh, quite the stuff I carry. Not quite. And not quite. And not quite. Ma- ma- like masculinity then you know you'd say why can't prints mean something first of all why can't I wear a print of a stadium or of a briquette I I, I come from the Boglands in Arcary one of the seasons with Duns I actually made a shirt print shirts from Pete Briquettes because it was just my, my childhood growing up in Bogs and, and, and that that kind of connection or uh, to the land that I have uh, of Arcary but like anyway print I felt was a place where you could go and do lots more meaningful stuff and, and put it onto garments so uh, why? Yeah, I wrote my book and I looked around the landscape and I, I, I respected Dunn's as a cultural institution as much as anything else. I feel like the GAA and Dunn's and, you know, there are some cultural institutions that, that are part of... I've never thought of that one before, it's putting the two together. Mm, nice idea, yeah. Yeah, it is. Like, I, I think Dunn's is a serious cultural institution. Like, my family, when I was young, I had a sister who worked in Dunn's. And she always had she always had money. Do you know what I mean? She always had a few quid, like you know what I mean. She'd look after me with a few quid, and was she was well paid. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, she was well paid, and she was happy, and she liked working there. And Nor, in Nor Kerry Tralee, the Dunn stores in Tralee was a big employer for a lot of our, our our parish and community. So I was connected to Dunn's from a young age, and I thought for what I wanted to say, I think this is the best place to say it. You know, so so who made I wrote the phone my book? Call? Yeah, I did really. I did. It. I sent my book to Margaret, Mrs. Heffernan. And um, I had a chat with Barbara Power from The Independent, who I had written for a few years. And, you know, I discussed it with her and she felt it would be a good place to do what I wanted to do. So I dropped my book into the reception of Dunn's head office one, one afternoon. And uh, I asked that it be, you know, given to given to Margaret, who who, who re- was very gracious, actually. And, but now you did not know this lady at this stage? No, I hadn't. No, yeah. no. You know, knew her, knew her, you know. Did if, she know you? Um, she's she follows her GA, you know. So I think she maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> I don't know. I think she did, but she she would go to her games and enjoy her GA, you know. So, um, and and the, I'm still very connected to all the guys at the front desk in Dunn's head office as a result because they were my first point of contact and they were so gracious to you know it was you know I was nervous going in there really because I'd never been in there before. I didn't know who I'd meet or what I'd meet, and. I think it was Julie at the front desk who I gave the book to, who ensured that it got to where it was meant to go. So I, I, I'd be still, I'd be feel very warm towards all the front desk reception people in head office since ever since. But anyway, it got to Margaret and we started talking. And no, sorry, that, that you've skipped over the interesting bit because many, many people here would love listening to this uh, podcast. Would love to be able to get in the front door and up the elevator into Don's stores. So what was the process? Like you send the book. Yeah. She or somehow yeah. the contact is made, yeah. but then you start have to you st- then have to start, um, you know, doing business. Yeah, well, you're right. A lot of people would, and I'm very, I'm very grateful and conscious of the fact that I can. And I, I, I have a, you know, seven, eight year, we're going on eight years now together in terms of business and uh, the partnership. But I, I basically sent the book, and we, we, we made contact on Twitter. Actually, I think it was initially, and then we. So I had had stuff made. I, at that point, had had stuff made, clothes and shirts, and I had been using my tailor, Henry Dixon, down in down in Strand Street, and I had in, Tralee. in in Dublin actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 in Dublin actually, and I had a cobbler down in Tralee working out of a half door in Tralee who was adding 
he was he was he was what you call it re-engineering and reusing shoes. So it was all reused. The collection I had put together of ten or fifteen pieces was all repurposed, reused, re-engineered. So I had trouser legs stitched onto shirting. I had track legs stitched onto t-shirts. I had all sorts of panels and repurposed tracksuit onto shirts, trouser legs onto t-shirts. I had stuck soles onto shoes to give the, sh- the shoe a bigger silhouette. So it was all reused, which was probably a little ahead of its time at the time. Anyway, look, at it was enough. Margaret asked me to bring it in and I brought it in and I showed the head of design and the head of menswear and I told them what I wanted to do. And I guess they saw somebody, look, at it was... It was somebody with a point of view, somebody with interest, somebody who had gone to the trouble of taking the initiative to go and make this thing and and and, and present it and make it kind of make sense. So so we started from there, and that 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 was it. You know, we're we're going on eight years now, and it's then you're still hopping over things with somebody. I find this really interesting. What was the first order, and what did you feel about the first order, and what did they say? Do they say screw it up and you're dead or No, no, no. We 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 just yeah, we took it slowly, you know what I mean? Like so do like I mean the order in terms of the order is the Duns Duns do the ordering. So they their supply chain and logistics and delivery and the retail infrastructure and all that. So what they're buying from you is the design. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my service is design, storytelling, um, content, copywriting. So all the creative elements and you know, my 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 point of view, basically and can you remember um, what, how many units? I don't know how they refer to them. I go by I go by budgets. I go by budgets. <laughs> I go by budgets. What I go by, I know budget by season. You know what I mean? And but I, is it getting bigger and bigger? Yeah, yeah. No, it's cool. doing it's doing fine. Yeah, yeah. It's it's growing. It's growing. You know, and like you, you, at the end of the day, you have to be able to, you know, that's that's the name of the game. That's the business. So you can talk all you want about the language approach to retail and to design and storytelling, but. It is, it is a numbers game and you have to be conscious of the numbers as well. And there's another guy who is with Duns, I think he still is, anyway, Paul Costello that I have interviewed. Such a nice guy. Great guy. And he was telling me, another insight is that he has the design capability, so then he puts it onto spoons and chairs and tables and whatever. Yeah. What yeah. is Paul Galvin's spoon or chair going to look like? Yeah, yeah, no, Paul is an artist in his own right and a great guy and has been a great... No, I mean Paul Galvin. What is Paul Galvin's yeah. chair going to look like? Well, I have, I have, you know, we we do apparel, we do clothing only. I don't, I haven't branched into any of the home That's what I'm asking. That. When, yeah, when yeah. Is that no, I don't know, I don't know. Like, mo- you know, I look at things like mugs. You know what I mean? And I, I drink a lot of tea, and I, I use a lot of mugs, and I look at three D printed mugs now, and new, f- a new, a new way to make. That's what I'd be interested in doing if I was to do that. Like, a bunch be, of guys down in Kerry called Wasp. Wasp, I know, uh, exactly. We've had them on. Have yeah, you? Yeah, well, yeah. well, exactly where I would go if I was to do it. It would be to, to yeah, 3D print t- uh, coffee mugs and tea, tea, tea cups and that kind of thing. I, I, I think it would be interesting. But Paul, I, I have a print, I have a print, print mind as well, I think. Like Paul's an artist and he can add his, he can add his DNA to, to anything really because he's got the creative instinct to be able to create artwork and prints and that I have a I have a print ability as well um, but I haven't broadened beyond the clothing and footwear basically you know and, and I think there's enough in the clothing and footwear at the moment to, there's more growth there in, in that in that regard you know uh, not, I'm not convinced by you know, that, you, that you really believe that that you have enough on the plate because if you, if you spend your days looking at uh, stadiums and stuff like that the, uh, you've obviously got bigger ambitions. Let's talk, I mean, maybe we can move on to Cahan uh, Athletic Club, which is your club. You like to call it your club. Well, it's 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 something, it's, it is like you described it as niche and, and it's a good way of describing it. It is niche. It's something I kind of felt was missing. A little bit like the Duns business, I felt in menswear in Ireland there was something missing for Irish men, men like me. Uh, and and I felt in now looking at this kind of GA market, the sportswear market, that there was probably something missing there from the point of view of design and storytelling as well. So it's a design-led jerseys, really. It's a jersey brand right now. And and we provide clubs with some outerwear and some playing jerseys, training jerseys. And I bring a kind of a design sensibility or a design point of view to the to to, to what I do for them and give them try to give them a bit of meaning and a bit of local, their community pieces, really. So they, they, they can tie... The manager, the player, the supporter. And so for, ooh, through design, you can join all those in the one. And the clubs? And the clubs. Can make money out of it. Well, look at, I mean, I don't know, my own club, Fenuig, 
one of the reasons I, I, I kind of started it is because I wanted to help my own club, Fenuig and Kerry, that they could maybe... I think a lot of clubs are finding it hard, you know, financially to, to, to buy their own gear and, and you know, depends on where it's been made and the cost, of course, but, like, I like to try and um, help my club maybe not make money but save money. You know what I mean? So, like... But the, but this uh, Kahan one is on a lovely, lovely website. The amount of detail that you got into, the, the history behind it and everything. Kahan was a Kerry player. Former Kerry player, yeah. That yeah. people had forgotten about. But yeah. his back, the backstory is fantastic. Oh, and then you. you went into a whole heap of other people and their backstory. Yeah, I appreciate and, that, yeah. He was, he was. I was speaking to some young people from Tralee that played with John Mitchell's club where Joe Kahan played himself. And I mentioned his name to them, and they hadn't they hadn't really known anything about him. But listen, that was a hundred years ago. He played in the twenty. He played in the thirties and forties. But exceptional, exceptional. Yeah, yeah. Team of the century, team of the millennium. One of the great footballers, one of the great fullbacks, was Mick O'Dwyer's right hand man then as well throughout Kerry's kind of golden period of the seventies and eighties. So you know, had a long service with Kerry football, and I didn't like the fact that if he was forgotten, then there was many more like him forgotten, not just in Kerry but nationwide. And that's why when you went to Claren Bridge, is that what you were telling? Well, Claren Bridge got in touch then to do to do to do you know a man got in touch to see would I do something for them, and we did it, and we're we're we're, we're you know so I don't be I don't be I don't intend really chasing business on the, on this really you know what I mean I think. You know, it's it, lovely though. It's lovely. I'm enjoying it. It's and like a, well, Americans will call it a side hustle. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think I think it's important that um, it's an important service. I think for clubs to avail of, and um, I, I do my own club, and I do. There's maybe eight or ten other clubs, and 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 I'm able to create a bit of meaning for them, and and you know, try and try and help them, try and help them e- economically, shall we say, you know. But you are only thinking of GA at the moment because I had a chat with somebody about this this morning and saying that you're coming on and what you're up to and all. And they immediately said, oh yeah, I've, I'm in a golf club. We'd be interested in that. So it's kind of, this could have yeah, legs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, and it's I, all niche. You know, it's going to be small runs. Yeah, I do. I do. You do according to the club, we'll say. You know what yeah. I mean? No, there's a little retail, direct-to-consumer retail aspect as well. But really you are, yeah. You're making, a, you're making to order. And I mean, that's not easy to do, actually, because you've got to find the factories that will actually provide you with, let's say it's 35 of this, 50 of that and 100 of that, you know what I mean? Factories are driving the the, 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 the menswear business and the fashion business in lots of ways, you know, with huge minimum quantities that you have to meet. To I, I love the fact that uh, people like you who hadn't, and I say hadn't, but you uh, have been for the last eight years, you hadn't got a background in business. And suddenly, the realities of business hit you and you... I presume, probably thought you just walk in, you say, I'll have a thousand of those or whatever, but I only need 35 or whatever. Business is not straightforward. No, and it is really, it is really difficult. And I, it, it, the Kyohan business gives me a great exposure to that side of it, albeit at a manageable level, not at the, not at the huge level, we'll say, of a big retailer, but at levels that are manageable to me. But it's great experience for me to be dealing directly with a factory dealing directly with fabrications, dealing directly with um, deliveries, storage, whatever it might be. It's, huge, it's hugely time-consuming and, and, and difficult, like you said. Do you know what the best part of the Kuhan thing for me is? You've taken the labels off. The, you know those things that stick into you? Oh, yeah. That was genius. Yeah. I cannot tell you on side, how much I, the ones on the side yeah, yeah, yeah. they dig into you you cut yeah, them off it's printed on the back and now they're sticking to you still I also read that you've just very wisely put them onto the website amazing like yeah, <laughs> I yeah. can with look all at the, care, the care details onto yeah. the website yeah 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 I'd be with you on that in terms of whose the idea was that that was my own yeah good yeah. man well it it, 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 it it can reduce what do you call it not to reduce costs, but I, f- I always found it superfluous. It is, John. Sure, then nowadays give them about 500 languages and it's yeah. about as thick as a Bible and yeah. uh, blah, blah. So, yeah, I yeah. found it superfluous always and I would, I would be with you on that and I would always find myself pulling them off and they would annoy me and that. So like I said, you know what, put all the details on the website and we'll print some information on the back neck. and, and uh, Done, finished. It's less, it's less materials and it's less. It's a little bit more sustainable. I don't, the sustainable one's a funny one, but... Sorry, what does that mean? You well, it, 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 you're using obviously less... No, no, I understand that, but you said sustainability is a funny one. What's your thinking? You've got a very different way of thinking, and I like hearing it. Um, well, like, it's a challenge, right? You know, it's it's a one that in the business I'm in, you have to be conscious of what you're making, where you're making it, how much of it you're making. Um, I would have, a, I would be of the view that sustainability can come tr- through meaning as well. And what you design and what you make 
if it means something, then the materiality, I think there's a trade-off between okay. materiality and meaning. And if you can design and storytell and give something compelling to a customer that that will be timeless, that the print will mean something too, that the message, the slogan, the color will mean something to the person forever, I think materiality then can, there's a trade-off there. And I, I, I think meaning is sustainable. Creating meaning for somebody is a form of sustainability. Creating meaning for a customer is a form of sustainability. I believe in this through the, through the Dunn's business. I believe in it through the Kyohan business. And obviously, you're always, we are and have to be conscious of um, materials, waste, environment. We are. We discussed it only yesterday in Dunn's at length and what we're doing. And we're doing, we're doing a lot, actually. But we, um, I do believe that meaning is a form of sustainability and emotion and, and nostalgia is a form of, and memory is a form of sustainability. Did you ever read the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? No. That's one for you. It was written about... I'm making note. I'm trying to think back. I probably read it, oh God, a long time ago. It is, if you get through it, it's a bit of a read. And the whole point is, there are two ways of looking at a motorbike. One is, it's a motorbike and it goes. Or two, the zen of it is the work that went in to make it go. And I love that. That's always stayed with me. So it's yeah. exactly what you're talking about. I get that completely, yeah. yeah. I got, I got, it was my birthday recently and my wife Happy bought birthday. me. Thank you. <laughs> Say no more. My wife got me a piece of art. And already it is adding value to my life. It's on a wall and looking at it just pleases me and makes me takes me somewhere do you know what I mean it was by a young Irish artist who I think is a very important young leader in our for Irish guys a guy called Neil Patrick Collins he, he's a Roscommon boy he used to play Gaelic football for Roscommon actually brilliant artist that I that, uh, to my eye anyway not that I know a lot about it but but if it pleases you that's it all does, you need, it yeah. does it does it pleases me and I think that's a little bit and of what you're, you're talking you, about yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so the future. What is the future? You've already avoided telling me that you're going to make, um, I don't know, cookery sets or whatever. No, I won't be doing that anyway. No, I won't. Uh, I, you know, I don't know the future. The future, I'm either, I'm either living in the future or living in the past as a person. I'm very rarely, am I present? Uh, I'm always thinking about the future or I'm kind of looking back at something. But um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I want to continue to take the, the, the Duns business to more Irishmen. I, I think it's important. It's become more of an anti-oppression type of a brand now to me than a, it was never a fashion brand to me really, but like obviously that's what it is, but it's more about anti-oppression and giving Irish guys a good place, a, not a safe place, but a place where they can go and buy their clothes if they want to dress and get into their style and feel good and go out. And, and I see more and more young fellas are like that now, you know what I mean? They're they're embracing it way more and they feel more confident and more. it's more allowed like to be into your trainers or your skinny jeans or whatever it might be. Whereas 10 years ago when I started this out, it was a tough place to be. It was a tough place to be. It was a lot of, I felt a lot of oppression, a lot of name calling and finger pointing and a lot of that stuff that I felt I got to, I got to tackle this because I think Ireland can, and you mentioned the North Kerry writers and storytellers and I think Ireland's better than what I experienced when I started out in this kind of fashion world. And I said, I got to push through there and make it okay for young fellas coming through that they can go and buy their gear and go out and be into their style if they want to be and feel good because it's all linked to self-esteem and self-confidence and, and expression anyway. And you can't oppress people and you can't... Fashion was an oppressor for years and years. like, But fra fashion can't be an oppressor. And it's Ireland in a country like Ireland. Ireland's better than that. Like I think, you know, an Irish man need to have... I needed to be a reference point, I think, a little bit for Irish guys to come through and say, you know what, I, I'll, I, can, I can go and buy my gear and put on these shoes and wear that colour shirt if I want it, it'll be okay. So that's how I see the Dunn's business now and I feel that has to continue and I want to continue to educate a little bit through, through the, the brand as well because I've learned more from my research and my interest in the brand has taught me more. I'm more of a teacher now almost than I was 10 years ago or a, or a, a student or whatever, you know, I do feel... My interest in what I'm doing continues to educate me. And I'd like for the brand to continue to educate others. I think that's what's important. We have a final question that we ask guests, and that is, who would Paul Galvin hire in a heartbeat? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. That's a great question. I, I'm lucky. I Over lockdown, through a mutual friend, I met a girl called Ashley McDonnell, 
who's a young digital executive at a company called Pooj in Barcelona. They're a, they're a luxury conglomerate that own a lot of brands, beauty brands and fashion brands. And she, um, I rate highly as a young business mind. So she would have just highly educated, um, very diligent, loads of energy. And I um, I think probably her, but I'm lucky that she has started to help me actually on the Kyohan stuff. So I, I can say that I've probably maybe found that person, luckily enough. But um, great, great question, though. Well, question. we ask that of everybody, and uh, frequently people say Richard Branson. But uh, yeah, well, uh, I think this girl will have a big career at great. a high level. Is she yeah. Irish or is she? She's a Galway girl. She's oh, a Galway good. girl. Yeah, yeah. I met her through Perry Ogden, who's a who's a photographer, filmmaker. I don't know if you ever saw the film Pavy Lacking. That was a f- film by pa- by Perry Ogden, and he's a fashion photographer. Did a Duns campaign for me a couple of years ago. Brilliant guy. Works with a lot of big magazines and brands, and that's so all. He actually through Perry, I met I met Ashley. And um, I do rate her highly, I must say. Final, final thing is you have probably one of the finest beards in this country. And poor old Tom Murphy, the sponsor of the program with De Facto, will be saying to me, would you ever get him to take the beard off? Is the beard ever going to come off? <laughs> well, you wouldn't, he wouldn't be the only one now because my mother would be delighted if I did and uh, a couple of others a couple of others around me would, would, wouldn't be sad to see the back of it either but what no. about Mrs. Galvin Louise Louise, Louise Duffy Louise quite likes it I think oh, I think okay. uh, I tell you it's gone quite grey now over the last while I've noticed it's gone that's called business as well yeah yeah I know I know in the last two years I'll tell you I've been you know what I mean a lot of a lot of diligence required and a lot of just um, focus on what's happening and supply chains and so yeah, it has been difficult, but anyway, yeah, no, the beard is here to stay. But I mean, I'm not, I'm not averse to the odd shave and the odd trim, and I certainly will be trying out de facto. Cause I, I, I must say, I'm big into names and language and words, and I, I think the name is great, de facto. It's a great brand name. Thank you very much for saying that. Yeah, Paul Galvin, Gurdjieff Mila Mahagat, what a guy. Thank Paul's you, Paul Connell. Gurdjieff Mila Mahagat. It's all go let Chrissy know on that great business show dot com. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. And we want to hear from you, so please do follow our LinkedIn page and anyone at all can have a chat with us there. We have smashed the 1,000 followers barrier on that LinkedIn page. And it's where we now are sourcing many of the great companies that we feature on that great business show. And De Facto backs your business, so please back them by buying the world's best shaving oil, defactoshave.com. And as creator Tom Murphy keeps reminding people, it's a shaving oil, not a beard oil. So it is for everyone that shaves. That's why he says it's the best anyone can get. That's great business show. Now, what is a micro enterprise? Well, it could be you. If you're a small business, including a self-employed person with fewer than 10 employees, and an annual turnover of less than two million, well, you're in luck. Microfinance Ireland is the place to go if you're looking for loans of up to €25,000 unsecured, though naturally T's and C's apply. They also consider applications from businesses that may have been declined by those banks that like to say they back brave and the rest of it. The newish CEO of Microfinance Ireland is Des McCarthy, And before we get on to how much cash he's handing out and to whom, I was tickled to learn that he shares one of my many gripes about how little financial literacy we have in this country, most warningly amongst those in both small and medium-sized businesses. Des McCarthy, welcome to that great business show for what I think is your first live interview. 
Well, may, maybe not my first live interview, but... Um, first podcast. Thank, thank you. It's certainly my first podcast. So thank you for having me on, Connell. I'm delighted to be here. Share your gripes. I like a good moan or a good gripe. Financial literacy. We can write for Old Ireland. We win Nobel Prizes for this, that and the other. We ain't winning. We aren't going to win any prizes for financial literacy or oh, I'd almost argue basic mathematics sometimes. Yeah, look, I think... What we have found that is that financial literacy is probably one of the deficiencies in, in among the SMEs. But you're you're dealing with such a broad spectrum of people. So not all SMEs and, and owners of small businesses are accountants, thankfully. And um, uh, they can't be good at everything, but they are good at, at some at, at, at many things. There may be marketing, maybe their forte. But so what we find is that um, some of them are struggling with putting their cash flows together and their P&Ls together. Um, but what we do um, is that we, through the Leo network, we work with them um, and provide mentoring to them to um, bring up the, 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 the financial literacy and the financial skills so that we take the mystification out of the, of, out of the finances. So entrepreneur goes to Microfinance Ireland or they can go through their local enterprise office, the Leo, and they get their loan. But is the loan dependent on them doing a mentoring course or accepting a mentor? Or how do you, I won't say enforce that, but how do you encourage them? Yeah, well, it would be a condition of our, of our, of some of our lending that there would be, um, a, a mentoring element to it. And we think it's an important part to it because it, it helps those businesses to succeed. So why wouldn't you do it? Um, and we also get guarantees from the European Investment Fund and they like to see the mentoring as well. So, um, w- it would be a condition of the loan that they would get the mentoring and then we would we would pay for it and it would be delivered by the Leo network and um, because the Leo has a huge network of people who have the, the, those skills whether it's financial or marketing or whatever it may be that you that you need for your business well team GBS we are big supporters of mentors and of course of the local enterprise offices what are you seeing out there at the moment there doom the end of the world and everything else was forecast are we seeing that yet? Well, I think there's there's a number of elements to that. So first of all, ar- ar- around the loans that we dispersed during COVID, we're actually finding that the performance of those loans in terms of repayment is, is actually much better than we had thought. So that's a really good sign. Another really good sign for us is that in the first six months of this year, we were really, really busy. And we were busy on COVID loans, so businesses that had an, had their business had been impacted by fifteen percent or more by COVID or by Brexit, they can get loans for for to to help them to get through those those difficulties. But what we really found is that a lot of small businesses were being started, and um, that was our biggest um, uh, our biggest cohort of, of of borrowers that we had this year. It was our, our the biggest slice of our market. So. Um, we felt very encouraged by that, that that's, that's a sign that even though the country was in lockdown, that people were starting their businesses. So that's good. And I just read something today, actually, from VisionNet that um, it, it, was, it was a very, very strong first six months of the year for business uh, registrations and startups. People uh, starting up a business could be seen in two ways. I prefer the second way, but the first way is desperation. They have to set up a business just to keep bread on the table. The second one is, and the one that I like is, that they want to go off and do it for themselves. What are you seeing in terms of what sectors people are in and is there a bigger sector than another, surprise sectors, anything like that? There there isn't really. I mean, it is across the scale. So for us, look, we're a, a, a business that provides loans to to, to micro enterprises and um, generally they are the, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, you know, nail bars and hairdressers and as you mentioned in, in, in your, your your promotional materials there, the taxi drivers. And it's it's of all sizes. So for instance, we would have had somebody who had been um providing uh, food at at one of the the local markets. Um, And then during COVID moved to a a van, uh, a food truck, and then found that it was so popular that they opened a takeaway. Um, uh, So a bricks and mortar, so going the other way. And, uh, you know, those those sort of people come into us, but also um, just people who want financial independence, who who have an idea or have a skill and want to start a business around it. And... um, we're open to take to applications for, from from all of those people. I suppose the, the the one caveat is that they 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 can't be bankable. 
they must be unbankable. So the we, we take the higher risk clients that the banks aren't prepared to take and, and and shouldn't be prepared to take because we have a high risk appetite and we're we can afford to have that because the government support us. We are a warts and all podcast because we like to be quite real about things and businesses do go wrong and they do go down. What is the process for, I'm a nail bar, I borrowed 25,000 from you. What happens when nobody's getting their nails done? Look, businesses do fail and and, and in, in, in a working economy, they have to fail. Not everything can succeed, but you want people to try things. Um, we're not like the other banks, but we, while we're unsecured, the, 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 the money that people borrow, it is, it is a borrowing and it is a personal obligation. Now, we will look to do our best to, um, to, to re, re, regain as much of that or to, to um, recover as much of that as we can. We would take a less stringent approach maybe than the banks, but it is taxpayers' money that we're, that we're using. So we, we do need to have um, uh, mechanisms to try to get people to repay as much as they can. Now, we, we wouldn't be um, heavy boots in the ground, but certainly we would be uh, tenacious and determined in, in, in making sure that it, to the extent that people have the ability to pay, that they, that, that, they, that they make a contribution to the debt that they have. There's a question lingering there about how do you enforce an unsecured loan? But uh, just on the, the word unsecured, though, in itself is very attractive, particularly to younger people, particularly who have no assets anyway, mm-hmm. and also to early, very, very early stage companies. Absolutely. Well, they, 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 so we, we, all our loans are unsecured and our, our loans are, I suppose, they're personal borrowings generally. And even if they're to a company, we, we, we would have a mechanism to make, I suppose, the, the, it a personal obligation. Um, is, that, is that legally enforceable? I don't want to har, har, hark on about that, but is it, that... It would be enforceable. It, it, it would be enforceable. Um, it's th- it's an indemnity. It's not security. Like we 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 we've gone through the legals on this. Um, but it is, I suppose, to put a level of obligation on on the borrower. So if somebody borrows money and if they don't repay it, there's absolutely no sanction and and and, and no um, implication on credit scores or things like that. Well, then there's very little um, reason for them to be repaying it. Um, so look, we we do have we we it is a personal borrowing. It's like if you have a credit card from your bank or if you have a personal loan from your bank. And um, we don't have security, so we you know we won't be coming after somebody's house or their 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 um stock or things like that. But we would expect people to be honest with us about their financial situation and that they would look to make as much of a contribution to the recovery of that loan as they possibly can. And one of the unusual areas that you are lending or have lent and may be about to lend again is to taxis. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think we've always lent to taxi drivers, but we uh, collaborated um, with, I said, well, we, we, we developed a product um, for green taxis, taxi loans. So there is a grant from the government uh, to incentivize taxi drivers to move to electric vehicles from fossil fuels. And we found that um, there was a funding gap there because the grant was about 25,000 and the the, the, the the vehicles were around 40 odd thousand. So there was a funding gap there. And because a lot of the taxi, taxi drivers um, didn't have a great year during, during COVID, the banks were reluctant to lend I'd say money. that's called an understatement. <laughs> it, well, let's, yeah, it is an understatement. But so um, we, we saw that there was a gap there and... Um, we we developed this product that would 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 fund that gap, um, and you know it's it's been quite a good product for us. We've had we've had a number of of inquiries and approvals for that. So um, now that grant funding, that grant from from the government has dried up. Um, so for twenty twenty one, I suppose that there, there's no more grant funding. But hopefully in twenty twenty two there may be further grant funding available, or the next tranche of it, and we would have that product available as well. But it doesn't stop people who want to buy a green, green taxi from coming into us and looking for a loan. But they, they would need to put an equity amount into it. And maybe that's their, their the, the old vehicle or something like that. 25,000 is better than zero. 50,000 is better than 25,000. Any chance at all that you can get back? Because you were, 
You, had, you were giving out 50,000, weren't you, at one stage? We were. I mean, in COVID, uh, at the beginning of COVID, from about March until July of this year, we got sanctioned from the government to um, to increase our loan size uh, for COVID loans to 50,000. Um, MFI was the first uh, institution to offer COVID-related loans and specific COVID loans. And that's because the government provided a huge grant funding to us uh, in order to do that. Um, and as and I suppose because there were the banks were less, um, they wanted to see how, how, how the, the business environment panned out. A lot of um, borrowers came to us who we wouldn't normally see. And I suppose the increased amount of 50,000 was, was, was needed for them. Um, however, I suppose as the, 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 the COVID pandemic panned out um, and we reopened the fund in, in, in August of this year, we reduced the amount of loan size to 25,000. Now, there, there may be a demand. We, we believe there is, there is potentially um, a, a, a market there for a higher amount of money. I'd say there certainly is. <laughs> um, but there are, other, um, there are other supports there. The COVID Credit Guarantee Scheme is one that covers its 50,000 euros and, loans. And you can add them together. Is that what I read? You can't. Well, I suppose, talking about adding together, I suppose one of the features of the MFI product is that we're quite happy to co-fund with the banks. So if the bank, uh, if you if you need 75,000 for, for your project and um, the bank is only prepared to give you 50,000, we're quite happy to look at it and, and give you the, 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 the additional 25,000. So, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can add them. Um, uh, but we, we but the maximum loan amount could have been fifty would have been fifty thousand anyway. So if you were say for instance you were a client of ours and you had a twenty five thousand euro loan with us for your normal business and then in COVID you looked for another fifty thousand, we wouldn't have been able to give you the fifty thousand, but we would have been able to give you another twenty five thousand up, up to a maximum maximum loan amount of fifty. And a an insider tip is that if you're trying to borrow money from Microfinance Ireland, if you go through your Leo. It's cheaper? It is, absolutely, yeah. Why? Um, well, I suppose the, the the Leos do a lot of work for us. I mean, the Leos are our biggest referral partner and they're most, our, our most important referral partner. Um, and they're very, very important to our business, not only through referrals, but also through the mentoring, as I mentioned earlier. So um, we offer a discount because the Leos have to do work for us. And um, we, we do find that the Leo applications um, tend to be of, of high quality. Um, both in terms of the the, the application, but that they have a higher approval rate as well. So, um, like we don't approve everything that that comes in our door, as you as can a imagine. Matter of interest, what would the general approval rate be? We would approve between forty five and fifty five percent of applications. So okay. there's still quite a significant um, decline rate. And the decline rate mostly would relate to like completely barking mad people coming in, or no, not necessarily. Well, I suppose the, the business has to be viable in in in, in our in our evaluation. Yeah, so but you and I both watch Dragons Den, and you see these people coming in, and they really are way with the fairies uh, about yeah. what a business is and what you know that they're going to change the world or something. Yeah, but I suppose we we we, we are dealing with what we would call the most challenged, the most vulnerable, um, and highest risk customers. So. You know, it is it is lending, and we and we do have an obligation both to the government um, and our other stakeholders and to our our guarantors that we will have a consistent credit policy. So it's not it's not grant money; it is lending. So there needs to be um, criteria around that and evaluation of that. But if I can just go back to the to the the, the interest rate, because I think that is important. So we've just reduced our interest rates from. Um, Seven point eight percent, and uh, and and to down to five point five percent. That's a bit of a drop. It is a big drop, and I'll tell you why that is. That's because we have just signed a new funding agreement with SBCI for thirty million euros. So we have thirty million euros of new liquidity, and it's burning a hole in your pocket. Absolutely, wanting to get out there and lend money to 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 to, to smaller micro businesses. But the, I suppose the cost of the lending uh, from SBCI is far lower than our previous cost of lending, our cost of borrowing, for us borrowing. So, um, so we were able to reduce our um, 
our, our funding for our, our interest rates, but also by the legislation that Microfinance Enterprise Fund was set up under um, restricts the margin that we can charge to borrowers to 5%. So, you know, we, we were, because our, our, our own borrowing costs fell significantly, our rates had to fall significantly so that we would stay within that requirement. Okay. And very briefly, from start of application to getting the cash into your pocket, how long does that take? I'd say about 10 business days. That is quick. It's pretty quick. Yeah, we, we, try, to, we try to be as flexible as we can. You know, I, I think, you know, some of our borrowers would probably say that we ask for too, in, too much information and we, you know, take too much time. But there's a lot that we do with, 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 within that time. I mean, as, as, as a, a, a lender to high-risk businesses, I suppose one of our key evaluation criteria is the, the business owner themselves to understand them and their motivations, their enthusiasm, their, you know, their determination to get through the hard times that, that they'll face. So we always do, well, pre-COVID, a face-to-face visit with, with, our, with our borrowers. Um, and in COVID, we were doing Zoom or, or else just phone calls just to try to get that feeling for the borrower and their business. So there's quite a bit, quite a bit that goes through that. But, you know, in, on the happy path, as, as, as we used to call it in the banking world, 10 days should, should, should get you there. And it sounds like, Des, you have plenty of money to give out at the moment, so you're open for business. But I do have one final question for you. We always ask who, uh, all our guests is, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Well, I would hire in a heartbeat a gentleman called Elwyn Grunewald. You always give me these names, or people give me these names that I can't spell. Elwyn? I will, I will spell it for you afterwards. <laughs> okay. Runa? No, Grun, Grunewald. Oh, Grunewald. Okay. Yeah. I'm with so you. Okay. I hope I've pronounced that, that, that correctly. But Elwyn is an amazing character who is CEO of the Dutch equivalent of MFI. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a company called Credits, spelled with, spelled with a Q or E-D-I-T-S. And it's a fascinating organization um, that has grown massively. It's, 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 it's a bit older than, than we are. Um, but it's much, much more digital and was digital first. Uh, and um, uh, he, he's grown that business incredibly. And also he, he's grown it to be a profitable, self-sustaining business as well. So um, certainly he, 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 he wouldn't come over to do my job, I suspect, but I would love him to be an advisor to us because I think that he has achieved a huge amount with that particular business. Am I hearing some very interesting ambition on your part? Will you go digital and do you want to be finally self-sustaining and become a standalone? Um, so in terms of digital, yes, we need to go digital. We are a very manual organization. We were set up in 2012 um, by the minister to be an enterprise support mechanism, a jobs creation mechanism. And, and it's been incredibly su- successful. We've created nearly 10,000 jobs. So, um, but... We were given grant funding. We're funded by, by grant for our operating costs and, 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 our, and our losses and provisions. Um, and we fund our, our, our business through the borrowings that we have with the SPCI. Um, but in 2012, and per the business plan then, we were given sufficient grant funding to keep us going for 10 years. So there was effectively an implicit sunset date of 2022, which is next year. And we nearly got there. We nearly got there. Uh, and had it been had it not been for COVID, we probably would have got there. Um, so because it was only a 10-year project, we didn't invest in technology at all. We're very, very manual. Um, and, um, you know, we run off spreadsheets and things like that, uh, which is fine when you're a smaller organization. But certainly as we've grown and we've grown a lot, um, we, we know we need to, to digitize. But we need to digitize for our customers because our customers need to be able to and interact with us the way they would interact with any any other um, organization. So they need to be, ha- be able to um, to apply online and that'll be straight through processing, all of these lovely things that that, that the banks talk about and, and are doing. We need to do that too. Um, that there'll be, you know, ability for whether you're a the, the a Leo uh, network um, head of head of network or an accountant or whatever that you can you can apply to us online and we will it'll all be 
um, it'll all be digital. And we need to do that. Because the sun is not going to set on MFI, is it? No, it's not. In fairness now, I have to say the government have been enormously supportive. Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment have been really supportive of us. Um, they provide us with an additional nearly 25 million of grant money last year um, because we needed it to fund our lending. So we, we had actually run out of all of our bank lines. And when COVID hit, the government provided us with um, additional grant so that we could fund small businesses. So a lot of that money has been used to fund these small businesses through COVID um, and um, post that now in, in, into the into our, our normal lending. But it has given us permanence as well. So um, you'll last beyond twenty twenty two. We you? certainly will. We certainly will. Good. Hopefully, we'll be there long before I'm gone. So um, long, long after I'm gone, should I say? But um, oh, yeah, I was trying to figure that one out. Yeah, yeah okay. long, long, long after I'm gone. Um, so look, we're building for the next generation. Our, our digital uh, journey is only beginning, but we need to do it because this this organisation will continue to grow and will continue to be needed. You know, and I think it's probably even going to be needed more in the future um, as the banking landscape changes, um, as more and more young people look to start businesses and get their side hustles up to commercial um, levels and things like that. They need the money and it's not easy, not always easy to convince your bank that you're a 21 year old who's just got this brilliant idea and you've been you know, doing it on the side for a while and now you want to commercialise it so can you give me 25k? Uh, it's not always possible to convince them, but at least we're, we, you know, we may not approve you, but you have a good shot with us. And we love a good side hustle. Desmond Carthy, CEO of Microfinance Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you, Carl. Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make De facto the world's best shaving oil, your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of De facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. If you listen back to, I think, episode 15 of That Great Business Show when we had Tony Smurfett, CEO of Smurfett Kappa, on. I think he said that they have over a thousand designers in-house coming up with clever solutions for packaging and box making. And that's just one tiny example of where design can infiltrate every aspect of business. I mentioned at the beginning something I wasn't aware of, which was that designers are currently trying to hide the ugly electricity pylons and make those massive steel constructions look like old-fashioned, you might even say quaint, electricity poles mimicking the old timber poles. And the person who told me all about the pylons is sitting in front of me, and she is Rosemary Steen, CEO of the Design and Crafts Council of Ireland. Rosemary Steen, welcome to That Great Business Show. Well, thank you so much for having me. You are the world's expert on hiding uh, um, masts, Vodafone masts in trees. And now that you started telling me about mimicking those, um, the the, the, uh, power transmitting pylons and making them into what Mm. looks like timber. Mm. And I suppose that's part of the, the reason why I'm in the Design and Crafts Council now, because it's really those challenges around our society that I've built my career around. So I had fantastic opportunities working in Vodafone to go in and and work on really complex problems around why masts, mobile phone masts were being rejected by communities. 
and worked with a fantastic team of engineers there who did some really clever things in terms of how they designed and made those those things look. And, that, and did that, those trees, were they designed, I don't mean were they designed yeah. in Ireland, but did the idea come from Ireland or were they, I think I saw them abroad before they came to Ireland. They were abroad before they came to Ireland and uh, part of my early days in Vodafone was actually driving around um, in the UK looking at examples of mobile phone masks. Doesn't get more exciting than that, doesn't, does it? Doesn't, but I suppose the key thing was that really the there was a real wish within Vodafone and as there is in all of these world leading companies to try and get to a solution so that they can continue with the product. And really, that's where design has this little bit of magic. And really what they were trying to do was find a way to make something that the public had found unacceptable, acceptable, because it was in the public interest that there would be good quality coverage. And it was very, look, it was a fascinating project at that stage of my career. And the excitement was too much for you. And then you went to AirGrid. <laughs> yes. And you then, where you found out all about these, um, yeah. uh, the, the, the transmission pylons. Yeah. And when I arrived in AirGrid, they were at a fascinating point as well. Um, they were in the middle of, of reconsidering kind of projects that they were rolling out across Ireland. Again, really strategically valuable projects. But again, there was resistance to them, largely because of the way that they looked. And because again, they are ugly. Well, they, they are to some people. Believe it or not, there is a website called Pylon of the Month where a ah. dedicated group of followers vote for their favourite pylon globally. Last time I looked at it, it was one from, I think, Lanzarote that was leading. So there are things and about, there. you know, what's beautiful to you may not be beautiful to somebody else. And that's one of the important things about design is looking at who is the user of a product, who's going to be looking at it. And unfortunately, at that time, in both Vodafone and Airgrid, engineers really did consider these things of beauty. You know, they really found it very difficult to consider that somebody didn't view them. And to a certain audience, they are beautiful. But maybe they're not beautiful if you feel they're too close to where you want to be in your life. Um, but I suppose part of my journey was nobody said to me, this is design, you know, that you're now working in, in terms of design solutions or design thinking. But in effect, I was. And I suppose what I noticed about both of those companies, they didn't have designers. And now looking back, I wonder how much value design, if it was kind of integrated into those companies as part of the way that they do business, might add. And so I was brought in as somebody at that stage who does thought a little bit differently. And that's what probably would mark me out in my career is that I do think differently about things. And that's what would be about like a core feature of design. And you look at Pylon of the Month. I look at all kinds of things, Connell. I love getting different people's perspectives on things. Everybody thinks differently about things. It's a brilliant thing about diversity. And that's what really attracted me to the council. Because the council is uh, the Design Crafts Don't Council. Be, I was going to yeah. say, the council yeah. being the Design and Crafts Crafts Council. council. Yeah, it's a unique organisation. It's 50 years old this year founded by a most amazing group, largely of women, in the 1970s, who were brought together as a result of the World Craft Council, who visited Ireland. And they wanted to do something to help rural communities. And there is a thread here in terms of development. They really wanted to try and bring economic prosperity to the regions. So they came together and they founded the council, and its first office was in the RDS. And lo and behold, 50 years later, now the organisation has 3,500 members, all craftspeople and designers, and 70 member organisations. So it's one of these uniquely democratic organisations. Half the board is elected from the community and half from the funding department, the Department of Trade, Enterprise and Employment, nominated by the Thánaiste. So it's a really fantastic organisation because you have that mix Uniquely, I think, in an Irish institution of the membership and clients sitting at the decision making table with the funders and the CEO. And that I love because I do really like diversity of thought. I like engaging with many people and hearing their feedback and then trying to pull it together in a way where we can drive the sector forward. And the reason why I was attracted to me is, do you know there's 105,000 people in Ireland today employed in the design and craft community? I do, and because I read your Grant Thornton report. Very good. Well, with that, with that's that the same number. I, I just noticed it probably as the HSE employees. Did you know that? Yeah, and we are basically almost bigger than the telecommunications and information sector. When you, when you think about it, it's like the hidden jewel of the Irish economy. And we're actually like experiencing this massive renaissance in terms of activity in two different ways. Which is gorgeous. And one of the reasons I presume is that there is a renaissance is because of the internet, 
that it's now a worldwide showcase or a worldwide shop yeah. window. How and ever, last week, just last mm-hmm. week, I was talking to somebody who told me that they had gone online to get a designer, and it's a she, and she was a Ukrainian lady based in Mexico mm. who was designing something uh, for mm. Ireland. Mm. So it cuts both ways. Oh, it does cut both ways. And that's what we're there to do. We're th- here to support the Irish design community and the Irish-based craft community. Though we did during lockdown, we were fascinated by how many international hits we were getting on our website from globally uh, people thinking, oh, we're doing best practice, particularly around our Made Local campaign, where we were marketing very heavily indigenous craft products as part of the kind of economic recovery piece around COVID. And a lot of other countries looked at what we were doing there and kind of put in place similar campaigns. And I think with the increase in shipping costs, Connell, which have gone up very significantly this year, much more domestic economies are going to be going, can we get local gifting? Can we get much more economic value? And we've had very big support from our department here actually over the last year in terms of giving me funding to get those campaigns moving and bringing that coalition of makers together. Because the other thing that's brilliant about our making community is they're a very highly educated group. You know, it's a lot of them have third level qualifications, which comes through in the Grand Thornton report. It's, it's really interesting how it comes together in these very high-end products. We have some fantastic makers like Nigel O'Reilly, who's like a a goldsmith who'd be internationally recognised now. Uh, You know, his creations would be selling at auction in New York for hundreds of thousands of euros. Is he your favourite? No, I don't. I have a. I have to. I love them all. No, you, you know. I'm, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going yeah, to beat you down yes. until you say no. Give us a few examples of no, but you see, hidden talent that no. people should know about. Oh, but they are all. I, I all my children them. are equal. But I have to say, look, what we try and do in terms of just bringing them all together is we have this wonderful event called Showcase in January in the RDS, and we basically have all the stands of all the makers there. Oh look, I could talk for hours about them all. I mean, I today to. I'm I'm I've got a Voca with me. I'm wearing a Voca. I have Bernie Murphy in uh, Donegal, her coat. I love Irish designers like Fiji, Louise Kennedy. You know, there's so many of them, Connell. But I suppose at the core, though, the ones that I really respect are the makers working in communities, providing local employment, and obviously in West Cork. There are many, you know, the pottery community in West Cork. There's a whole world which operates and is sustained by craft. And really pulling them out, it's kind of almost the ethos is that what some people, some crafts people need the support and want very much to go globally and market themselves internationally. But some others are motivated by the freedom of just operating and providing a service to their community. I've forgotten his name, but there is a cutler, as in a person who makes uh, knives down in West Cork. Yes. And I was on to him and he, <laughs> I've tried. He won't come on to the podcast. He's very yeah, no, exceptionally they're... happy to stay down in West Cork. Yeah. He also has an order book for three years. years. And that's the incredible thing about this. There's enormous richness in that freedom. So a lot of them, you know, I'm thinking of the kind of like we've ceramicists like Sarah Flynn, who would have started out as very much a commercial potter making tableware. But her pieces now sell for many thousands of euros and she just does special commissions. Have you got any? You know, (laughs) not yet. (laughs) I'm only new in the door. But I was watching these things before I joined the council because what was happening, I think, since 2015, which was the year of design that celebrated design in Ireland, there became more and more confidence around the sector. So if you like, the sector itself began to believe in itself. And look, as you know, it's probably quite a brave move hiring somebody like me, bringing them in and kind of going, okay, what can you do? A woman who loves pylons, yep. (laughs) Well, what what I want to do is really get a conversation going about this really valuable sector and how it can be supported more. The council has been there for 50 years and is really the bedrock of that community. But if you think of the funding and the government support that's going into sectors like telecommunications... You know, I do feel duty bound to say, listen, lads, there's something really significant happening here. It's a real trend in terms of consumers. It's all about sustainability, about local economies. How can we at a policy level really do more about this? And what could you do? 
Well, well, there's two aspects to it. So both sectors are different but similar. They both need different types of support. So the craft community is very much about a network in terms of both domestic and international sales. So we do a lot of webinars, tuition, mentoring, and trying to get them access to finance, which is why it was so lovely to meet Pat earlier, you know, in terms of just the, the linkage there. But the, the issue is also about kind of, I suppose, a lot of them work individually. And what I've noticed going around meeting them all is they're all in studios and the council is a forum for them to come together and share best practice. The design community came into the council in 2015 and they have very different needs. They're also very much a lot of sole practitioners, but increasingly what we're seeing is designers in large companies like the Vodafones or the Airgrids or the, the Smurfits. Smurfits, where they're brought in to solve very particular um, problems. And having a designer in those companies is adding three to 400,000 in terms of gross value added, you know, in, in terms of how that company reports on the bottom line in terms of their presence. So with them, it's more a discussion about how they can be supported to grow their recruitment, to have adequate numbers, to be able to move more into industry. But also, and the critical thing that I'm trying to do is because I have had that corporate career, is say to those corporates, have you thought about having a designer involved? Have you thought about what could happen? And can the council increasingly become a home for the design community where they can be brought together and marketed out to that broader corporate audience in a way that will work for that community? And what is the general response to that? Have you thought about a designer? Do they just say overhead, gone, not, not happening? Well, I think those debates are what where a designer can add value in a company to bring that discussion to the board table. We're all used to having the CFO sitting there or the lawyer sitting there. Increasingly now, if you think of the challenges facing the public, it's all about design, sustainability, things being beautiful and functional. And, you know, we're all watching the COP kind of discussions. They need to be considered in terms of their impact. And design thinking and the processes around design thinking, thinking about the user, thinking about stakeholders like myself, are really important in that. And increasingly, if you look at what was happening around the transmission system by the time I left Airgrid, even big transmission stations, they were being um, surrounded with mirrors so that you wouldn't see the transmission station in the landscape, like really clever solutions. And engineers had been on a journey to say, yes, we actually must listen to these voices outside and try and alter, even though we think the thing is beautiful, make it more beautiful to maybe what the external community thinks. And that's part of why design in all its different guises can be so important to, in an economic sense. Because to be honest with you, Connell, having been involved in many, many corporate roles, a lot of money can be wasted by people going out with the wrong product not being fully considered. And that's where a designer in-house can add massive value. You have got to tell the listeners about the incinerator. Is it in Denmark? In Denmark. Well, no, one of my my favourite examples of design in, in kind of public acceptance is this wonderful, if you can call it that, incinerator in Copenhagen, which is a fantastic example of where the local community definitely did not want an incinerator. But the architect, who's a very famous person from Copenhagen, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he was he was really at the centre of the project, went out to the local community and said, what would you like? What is the thing that you would most like? And the response was a ski slope. So when they designed the incinerator, if you visit Copenhagen now on the on the skyline, you'll see this amazing building, which has a ski slope on it, which I have skied on. And I have to say, it really brings home that you can actually have both. There can be a win-win solution to some of these projects, but you have to be open to bring in these voices, to bring in the kind of different way of thinking about things. And I suppose when I talk about the craft community in terms of hearing all the voices and all the needs, that's part of my role is to kind of try and be listen to all those external voices and then say to government, do you hear this? Do you hear the opportunity here for Ireland Inc.? And it's massive because if you look at the job growth in the sector since 2012, we've gained nearly 40,000 jobs. You know, it's it's kind of like this silent heartbeat of the Irish economy. And I believe that we could have the same growth again between now and 2025. But we do need to recognise that with skills shortages and everything else, the sector needs to have a voice. It really needs to to be owned. And and that's my role to come in and, and basically say, right, how do we pull this together? Are enough people being trained and are they being trained well enough? 
Well, our chair, um, Andrew Badley, has been very involved in terms of a project working with the department on uh, design skill nets, which is all about recruiting designers um, in from third level into companies and working to make sure that there's adequate resources in place for those companies. And that's part of what I'm also looking for future funding for to try and resource and support the IDI and other design kind of related associations. IDI, we don't do acronyms here. (laughs) We actually find people for acronyms. (laughs) Well, it's the design community in its broadest sense. Standing for IDI stands for? Irish Design Institute. Irish Institute of Design, sorry, I'm probably saying it the wrong way around. So, so basically the way that the design community comes together within the council is they are what's known as a GAN. So they have an ability to elect people through the GAN network to the board. So that is an important part of the way that the council operates in that both the craftspeople and the design people have an opportunity through the guilds, networks and associations to bring people forward. So we're a little by little like the IFA to a degree. And we we kind of are very much drawn from the membership, which makes it very real in terms of being CEO, because you have you have real contact with people in that community very often. Philosophical question almost to finish on is there was a time when we're obviously very word and written literate because we win all these Nobel Prizes Mm. for literature and stuff like that. We were always told that we were visually illiterate. Mm. Discuss. Do you know, it's a fascinating discussion in that I think it's about the how the brain and the hands work together. So design, in my view, is very much about the brain operating. But then when it meets the hands, then you get this wonderful making experience. And what I see is this fascinating fusion at times. So I really like in terms of what I see on the ground in Ireland, Connell, it's it's the absolute reverse. You know, there's amazing things being made and created in Ireland. And what we have to do is really get that out and talk about what that means for the future of Ireland going forward. And it's a sector I'm just so proud to represent because I think it's all about the future. I think sustainability is going to be at the core of the Irish economy and there's so much opportunity for making in a sustainable way. So are we visually illiterate? Oh God, look, I'm not even going to, good. you know, I, as far as I can see, the Irish people have always valued creativity and beauty. And if you go back and look at the stained glass windows, like one of my earliest memories as a child was sitting in the church and looking up at the beauty of the stained glass windows that had been created by Irish craftspeople hundreds Harry of years Clark before. And all those yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. you know, it's always been there. But as I said at the at the beginning, it's very much like the secret jewel. It's almost revered and kept undercover. And people who collect these beautiful things, they're a very discreet group of people. You know, they're very low key and very respectful of working and collecting craft and, and design. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is to say that's good. But really, we also need to let the light in a little bit and let everybody see the beautiful things that are there and make sure that they're appropriately supported by government. And do you honestly think you can double the workforce between now and 2025? Well, I think there's an enormous opportunity to... That's huge, though. Well, if you look at the trend, and this is why the Grant Thornton report is of such value, and maybe we might be able to, on the podcast, post a little link to it. Of course you can, yeah. Yeah, it it just, I think it's the first really comprehensive study of the sector that's really ever been done. Um, And I think what it points towards is that if the trends in terms of design in other sectors continue on the trajectory that you're on, you could see 10 to 15 percent growth year on year in that aspect alone. And that does make sense when you think about why companies are having to adapt and change post-COVID. And that really reflects on the competition also that we're running at the moment, the Irish Business Design Challenge where we're trying to highlight those examples of best practice in terms of design. Because what we want is for the word to get out that design is an economic growth opportunity for your company, both locally and nationally, is really important. You know, it's 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 actually just um, incredible to see the difference it can make to the bottom line. So if you're saying to me, do I believe that if the ideas that we're sharing start to be adapted more widely, could it lead to those kind of numbers and job growth? Yes. And I, I, I really think it's incredibly exciting. And as you said a few times there, they are sustainable jobs. They so are sustainable. No what, oh, hopefully nothing terrible happens again. But when something else happens, the, the, the jobs might stay there. Final question always that we do ask uh, people, Rosemary, is who would you hire in a heartbeat? Oh, I would hire um, 
you know, there was somebody I worked with, um, a lady called Teresa Elder, who was my first CEO in Vodafone Ireland. And if Teresa was available, I would hire her in a heartbeat. Why? She was the first woman I worked with who was able to manage a very challenging situation with her family. Her son had cystic fibrosis and uh, deal with it in a corporate uh, work environment. She worked incredibly hard and she would go home to care for him. He couldn't breathe for most of the night and come in and do an amazing day's work. But one of the most fantastic things about Teresa was when she left Vodafone Ireland, she said she was leaving to return to the US to help her son. And I will never forget then seeing him and Barack Obama's last speech. He was sitting next to Michelle Obama. How cool is that? He had had access, thanks to the great work of his mum, to a dedicated programme to deal with um, cystic fibrosis in terms of these new meds that were being delivered and promoted by President Obama. And in terms of a woman who managed to achieve things corporately, but also was able to do amazing things for her family, she's somebody I'll never forget working she with. She's up there for that one, all right. Well well done you. I think, Teresa, you are hired. <laughs> so, Rosemary Steen, Chief Executive at Design and Craft Council of Ireland, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. And that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 6060. Helping design Ireland's best sounding podcast this week was sound engineer Rob Curry and the Versace of sound Peter Rice himself will be dropping our ads and all later. Speaking of which, if you'd like to advertise with us and to talk to Ireland's SME community, well, we are your both. We'll give us a call and we'll talk rates, etc. And we're back in the studio again next week recording some more great podcasts for the Love Irish Food brand. If you'd like us to produce world-class podcasts for your business and do get in touch and finally my thanks to our sponsor defactoshave.com the world's best shaving oil try it for just one week and like me you will be a forever convert so for me Conal O'Moran until next time